obeisances, all glories to Sri Prabhupada, all glories to our Guru Maharaj, and all glories to the Vaishnavas online. Hare Krishna. So, welcome to our Sarangati retreat, part two. Welcome to day two. We're happy to have those who have joined us for the first time today. Yesterday we talked about unfavorable activities and devotional service by His Holiness Chandramuli Swami. And this session we will talk about the favorable activities in devotional service. This afternoon we have Buddha Bhavana Prabhu who will also talk about the facts and fearlessness in our devotional service. So thank you yesterday for all the participants. We had some lovely feedback and we've also got um, some room for improvement. So we will endeavor to address those needs. Thank you. For those who have joined uh, for the first time, we just have some ground rules again. Please can you leave your microphones on mute? Please can you leave your camera switched off? And also please can we direct questions for the session directly to Radha Bhakti, so it helps us with less interference. If you have asked a question and you would like uh, Guru Maharaj to just um, acknowledge that he said the right thing or you want to uh, reply to that, just let us know via the chat and we can then connect you for a short while. Thank you Guru Maharaj and over to you when you're ready. Hare Krishna. Very well. Om Gyanti Mirandasya Gyanajina Silakaya Chaksu Unmilita Mihena Tasmai Shri Guru Veda Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste, Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine, Nirvishesha Sunyavari, Pastyatya De Satarine, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara Siva, Sri Gaur Bhakta Vrindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Hmm. So, so from Rupa Goswami's Nectar of Instructions, 11 verses on the process of pure devotional service. Uh, Srila Rupa Goswami covers the essential principles that make up the activities of devotional service along with the mood of devotional service. In that little short treatise, everything is covered nicely. It's a book that was highly recommended by Srila Prabhupada for devotees to read and study. And we've also performed uh, uh, a few seminars on this um, for those of you who, who want further information. And we can also give you the, re the, uh, the seminars, information that was discussed on the seminars. So um, we spoke on verse number two of Nectar of Instructions yesterday, which were the six things that were unfavorable to devotional service. It's always understood that one should always end on something sweet. So we always begin with the negative or what is, what about the negative? And now we end with what is the positive? So in devotional service, there is a very strong principle that, that covers everything, things to do and things to avoid. Anukulena Krishna and uh, Pratikulena Krishna, things that are favorable to bring us to Krishna, things that are unfavorable to bring us to, devo to Krishna and devotional service. So um, Rupa Goswami is the scientist and he is the Acharya for giving the understanding of how to perform devotional service. His information, knowledge has come from his divine grace. I'm sorry from Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself directly. In 10 days that he heard uh, the Lord speak, the subject of pure devotional service directly to him, it was just a one-on-one -on -one talk where he practically listened the whole time and the Lord uh, spoke. Later on, he wrote it down in the form of 
a few Shastras, and the main ones were Nectar of Devotion and Nectar of Instructions, Upadesh Amrita and uh, Upadesh um, uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. So yesterday we mentioned, and we'll just mention again briefly, what are the six things that, uh, that are against devotional service, things that one should avoid uh, just for a, uh, uh, a little bit of a reminder. And Atyahara prayasa cha prajalpaniya magraha jana sangas chalauyam cha sadbir bhakti vinashyati. Vinashyati means destroys. Eating more than necessary or collecting more funds than required. Over endeavoring for mundane things that are difficult to obtain. Uh, talking unnecessarily about mundane subjects. Practicing the scriptural rules and regulations only for the sake of following them and not for the sake of spiritual advancement. Or rejecting the rules and regulations of the scriptures and working independently or whimsically. Janasanga association with worldly minded people who are not interested in Krishna consciousness and Laoyam being greedy for mundane achievements. So we, we addressed our discussion to each one of these yesterday. Before we start uh, on speaking about the favorable things, I'd like to um, preface that by saying um, that. Um, um, yeah. Uh, okay, I was going to say something and I slipped my mind. Okay, Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu's class yesterday was fundamental to understanding the whole process of bhakti in one particular verse, which is also the verse coming from Bhakti Rasamrita to Sindhu by Rupa Goswami. Ayavila Sita Sunya Jnana Kamana Navratam Anukalina Krishna Silanam Bhakti Uttamam. When you understand the essence of that verse and the different aspects of that verse, you'll understand that these six, six things that are unfavorable and the six things that are favorable are included in that verse itself. So that these two categories, favorable and unfavorable, are expansions of that verse, which, as was mentioned yesterday, is called the Paribhasa Sutra. It's the emperor of all verses. It teaches what is the, the main principle of the scripture that it includes. And therefore, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu is the handbook for execution of devotional service. That verse is the most important verse. And that is devotional service should be done favorably in, and with a desire to plead Krishna, free from any material desires, from gain, from fruitive activities, or through philosophical speculation on the absolute truth. <laughs> so when you take it apart and kind of like break it down, you'll find and you can write volumes of literature just on that verse alone. And we have these two verses, which are what was extracted from that. And so I'll read, or I'll begin, to mention the six things that are favorable for devotional service. And utsahan nischaya darayat, tat tat karma pavartanat, sangha tyaga sadhuvrite, sadbir bhakti prashidyati. Uh, being enthusiastic, utsahan, nishchaya, endeavoring with confidence. Three, daryat, being patient. Tat tat karma pavartana, acting according to the regulative principles such as shravanam, kirtanam, vishnu, smarnam, hearing, enchanting, and remembering Krishna. Sangha Tiaga, abandoning the association of non devotees. Here we have it again, but it's mentioned in a different way. And Sadhu Riti or Satu Riti, following in the footsteps of the previous Acharyas. And the, of course, the previous Acharyas also means the present spiritual masters. Utsahan is enthusiasm. And this is often misunderstood as being a high energy activity that is performed for Krishna. But Utsaham is nice, is understood 
to endeavor with intelligence. That is the succinct and complete definition of enthusiasm to make your activities geared towards uh, uh, according to sadhu, sadhu, shastra, and guru. And that was, that's actually what enthusiasm means. Okay. Now, enthusiasm um, is important. And if one is, if it's negligent and one does not follow it, then inactivity, apathy, and indifference can come. Laziness, when enthusiasm is generated, laziness and inertia cannot remain. The absence of the desire to work is called inertia, and the opposite nature is uh, enthusiasm. Inertia makes the body and mind, you know, uh, lazy. Apathy, carelessness comes from also from apathy, like that. So these are the things that are the opposite of enthusiasm. Um, enthusiasm, it's mentioned that devotional service is practical activity, not sentimental speculation or imaginative ecstasies. Enthusiasm crushes all anarthas, and we mentioned three of them, we mentioned them all, laziness, negligence, apathy, and indifference. These are the things that can arise due to material association. When one is not inspired, by the, in the right direction for devotional activities, then apathy, laziness, indifference comes. Indifference to activities or indifference to material activities brings bhakti. Indifference to bhakti brings material consciousness. It's quite the opposite. Um, well, now there is different types of yoga. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains everything in relationship to the other yogas. He talks about karma yoga, jnana yoga, and ultimately bhakti. Um, when one doesn't have a taste to worship the Lord in pure devotional service, they, are there, they can follow the principles of karma yoga and perform some activities and offer those activities as a service to the Lord. In other words, they perform their material activities free from sinful activities or categories of sinful activities, and then offer that activity as an offering to the Lord. In other words, we do what is pious, religious, not necessarily in line with the instructions of the spiritual master, and we offer that to Krishna and that is called karma yoga. Karma yoga can help one bring indifference to material activities, but it doesn't touch the, the category of bhakti. It's a little bit better than being a materialist in the sense that one starts to realize that uh, just by trying to enjoy the fruits of my own activities, I'm struggling, I'm suffering. Therefore, let me offer something to Krishna and do, as an offering. And that verse is also there in the Bhagavad Gita. Yad karosi aranasi yad dadosi yad dadosi dadasi yad yad tapasi tu konta yad tat kurusho mararpanam. All that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer, and all the sacrifices you perform, all austerities you perform, Krishna says should be done as an offering to me. That's basically karma yoga. <laughs> Jnana yoga also rises from indifference to uh, materialist activities. Jnana yoga is, well, I tried so hard to enjoy in this material world. I can't enjoy. There's nothing in this material world I really want to enjoy. So let me perform austerities. Let me chant certain mantras. Let me uh, uh, worship the Lord with a desire to gain freedom from, this, from the sufferings of material energy. We see sometimes even devotees who perform devotional service are tinged by karma and gyan in, in bhakti. And therefore, even though they're performing bhakti, still they fall victim to these two, what they call as uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami calls them the two witches who haunt 
the devotee and devotional service, still trying to get some benefit from the activities of devotional service, material benefit, and still trying to get some position in relationship to spiritual happiness by merging into or uh, what we say, devoiding ourselves of material because as soon as you can stop all material activities or material desires, there's a sense of relief. But it's, that, it's just a stepping stone to a higher state of consciousness, which leads towards what we say devotion to Krishna. Unless one makes that final step, devotion to Krishna, and we understood what is devotional Krishna, to Krishna, everything has to be geared according to the activities given to us by the acharyas and the present spiritual master especially and one has to perform those activities in the mood to please krishna <laughs> if that mood to please krishna is not there then it fall it's still mixed devotional service it could be karma mishra gya or karma mishra bhakti or gana mishra bhakti in other words still there is some personal desires like that so if bhakti is flickering, and come, we come in and out of bhakti because of uh, because the tendencies of karma and jnana are still there, then what happens that there is some, uh, what we say, uh, things that come in our life. What is that? We lose confidence in the process of devotional service. We start to, de we develop certain doubts. Our endeavors are not continuous or sporadic. We perform what is enthousi enthusiastic what we like and then we find when we if we find things that are a little difficult or seems to be something that is contrary to uh, what i want to do then our endeavors are sporadic uh, indecision also uh, these things also rise when enthusiasm is there how should i serve when should i serve who should i serve what is the type of service I should do? We struggle with the senses. The mind and senses still divert our attention away from the pr process of devotional service. And they make the, the whole process of devotional service just a big struggle. We, we have vows. We take vows. Vows are given at different times in our devotional service. And then we have an inability to uphold these vows. This is also affected by the, the principles of karma and jnana, which, um, which make bhakti somewhat unsteady. So this is unsteady bhakti. And then uh, vows are made and vows are somehow or other given up at a certain time. We try to enjoy the facilities of bhakti. We explained that yesterday, Taranga Rangini, one starts to make advancement in devotional service a little bit. Somehow they make some advancement and what happens? They start to feel a little bit satisfied and what happens? They get things like good material situation. Uh, they find good things that they wanted in life in order to live nicely it starts to come. In other words, Krishna reciprocates their bhakti by providing what they need to live nicely. Then they start to enjoy that and consider that their success in bhakti. Um, another principle where enthusiasm is good is that by attentively chanting the holy names, we destroy anarthas, apathy, sleep and distraction. Bhakti Vinoda Thakur explains that that the eleventh offense to the chanting of the holy name is called inattention. He also makes the point that if unless one carefully overcomes this inattention, then the tendency to commit the other offenses, the other ten offenses to the holy name, still remains. So therefore, he explains that if you want to really make a point in terms of where to put your time energy in making advancement in devotional service, he says, it's done by attentive chanting of the holy names. There's three forms of inattention, distraction, uh, apathy, 
and sleep, becoming distracted by material thoughts while in the process of chanting and starting to dwell on those thoughts, starting to plan to fulfill those needs or desires. Uh, apathy, well, it's, a, it's something that I do. I have to chant 16 rounds. I, I'll do it. I do it somewhat lackadaisically. I uh, more or less look at the clock. I see how many beads I have left. I, uh, in other words, I'm in and out of japa because really I'm not putting my time, attention, and what we say devotion into the chanting of the holy names. And I just, I, I just, it becomes something that I do, but not something that I really, really try to perfect. So that's apathy and of sleep. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur also talks about these. He mentions distraction and apathy can be overcome by association with devotees who are fixed in Krishna consciousness. He says, one should take that association and chant along with these devotees. And then gradually these two things, apathy and distraction, will start to reduce and ultimately be gone. Sleep, when one is somehow or other not rested enough and they try to chant japa, or for whatever reason, we will become overcome with sleep and then we go in and out of japa in a sleepy state. Padivinot Thakur gives a little bit of a solution to that. He says, um, then one should walk and chant but of course, walking and chanting, it makes it a little bit more difficult to what we say, uh, keep the attention because there's uh, obviously opportunities to get distracted by the environment. So one has to be careful of that, but at least that keeps you awake. But if he says, even in that sense, if sleep is still bothering us, then one should uh, postpone their japa and chant when they are rested. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are some of the things that are uh, there when we don't have enthusiasm. Um, so in the, uh, uh, let's see, Madhya Leela, chapter 23, well actually, hmm. here, um, here's a prayer that is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the 11th canto. Um, sometimes we see devotees are still struggling after so many years to chant their rounds, to stay steady in devotional service, to develop the qualities. One should never be what we say, uh, what's the word, discouraged because of lack of, uh, one should take some analysis and see what needs to be done. But here, um, Krishna says here, having awakened faith in the narrations of my glories, being disgusted with all material activities, knowing that all sense gratification leads to miseries, but still being unable to renounce all sense enjoyment, my devotees should remain happy and worship me with great faith and conviction. Even though one is sometimes engaged in sense enjoyment, my devotee knows that all sense gratification leads to a miserable result, and then they seriously repent such activities. So here, it's never to get discouraged because of failure in devotional service. So therefore, when we see ourselves becoming victimized by the material energy, then we should still remain fixed in devotional service and try to overcome that. We see that success in devotional service takes much, much practice. <laughs> and enthusiasm is the principle where that strength to practice continuously comes from. Um, we find even in the material world, people who have been successful have had many, many, many failures. <laughs> I think there was this one person who created the light bulb, uh, Thomas Edison, 
how many times did he fail before he actually was successful? I think it was 1,000 times. Um, there's even modern day successes that took years and years. So never give, never become discouraged by failure in devotional service. Learn what to avoid and what to what to bring on and what's devotional service. Devotional service, karma, yoga, well, you can't remain steady in that. Jnana yoga, you go in that is also, but bhakti remains steady when we keep faith in both the process and in our ability to follow the process. Sometimes devotees find themselves getting discouraged because they find there that they keep falling down or failing or not able to come up to the standard. If you keep your faith in devotional service, Krishna will keep providing the opportunities for you to become, to overcome those things which are obstacles in your devotional service. So it's just a matter of time before success actually arises in devotional service. So one should always remain enthusiastic in devotional service. Our enthusiasm is gradually brought about as we overcome the anarthas. And um, of course, there are 16 anarthas, four categories, anarthas that are come by pious activities, anarthas that come by impious activities, anarthas that come by improper understanding of philosophical teachings, and anarthas that come by way of offenses. So, um, the, the anarthas that come by way of the fences are the most difficult ones to overcome because uh, one has to be very, what we say, aware of what of the offenses are and carefully avoid them. And that's why Nectar Devotion explains what are the offenses, offenses to the holy name. If you commit offenses to the holy name, carefully learn what those offenses are and try to avoid them. If you commit offenses to the deity or to, the, to Krishna himself, then the way to overcome that is to simply engage in more and more chanting of the holy name gradually through continuous chanting when the reactions for those offenses are destroyed. Offenses to Vaishnavas are not so easily destroyed. They come by way of uh, submissively approaching the Vaishnava, asking for forgiveness, and asking for some service that I can do in order to make up for my offenses like that. A Vaishnavas are by nature very kind. They don't take offense. And therefore, generally, uh, usually at 99% of the time, a Vaishnava is always forgiving of offenses. So as long as we follow this simple process of asking for forgiveness, and willing to do some service as a way to show our sincerity, then uh, that offense is overcome. And the last offense is offenses to the uh, people in general, even though they're non-devotees. Sometimes we have a tendency to minimize a non-devotee because they're non-devotees. Of course, our association is with devotees, but we understand that we were a non-devotee at one time too. <laughs> so to ridicule others because of their, what we say, lesser position, or to to neglect and properly treat them, and it can also can cause one to commit an offense. There was one devotee. He was, uh, he was on a plane, and uh, he was late for an engagement. The plane was also late in arrival. So um, he was a sannyasi, and he was trying to hurriedly get off the plane so he can go on. So he was somewhat a little bit, uh, what we say, impolite in getting off. And uh, one lady, she noticed how he was acting, and she spoke. She said, uh, does your religion teach you to become impolite? And, uh, of course, it, it kind of shocked him when he heard that. And then, of course, he changed. So, yeah, so it doesn't, we should also give all respects to the non devotees in the proper way. That means we don't cause them any unnecessarily, any, any unnecessary inconvenience.
or minimize their existence. So this is a little bit about enthusiasm. Um, and of course, uh, when one has in faith, then enthusiasm is strong. Faith without enthusiasm, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, is meaningless. So we have to show our faith through in, acting in, an, in a way that brings about the principles of enthusiasm. That means endeavoring with intelligence, following the rules and regulations as given by the Acharyas. The next one is confidence, or sometimes it says determination. Um, this one is a little bit complicated and it's quite extensive. I'll try to summarize this into the essence. Um, uh, confidence is fortified by understanding the three basic teachings of all scriptures, which is Sambandha. Sambandha means relationship. Abhideya means activities and devotional service. And Prayojana means achieving the goal of devotional service. Uh, one cannot understand Vedic literature. These three, these three activities are the essence of all Vedic literature. literature. Vedic literature teaches us what is our relationship with each and every category of life, such as our guru, devotees, devotees who are senior, devotees who are peers, devotees who are in lesser positions, what is our relationship to the non-devotees, what is our relationship to the material energy, relationships. That is the biggest category that is mentioned in Shastra. What is relationships and what is the nature of that relationship and how to perfect that relationship by proper understanding and proper activity. Now, their Vedic literature cannot under be understood by what we say by hypothesis, which is called uh, Anuman or Prayaksha by empirical understanding. It can only be understood when we hear from the authorities. That's called Upanaya. I'm sorry, not Upanaya, Amnaya. Amnaya means to understand the Vedic teachings coming from the Acharyas. Therefore, to try to read and study scripture on one's own is somewhat risky in trying to understand what the scriptures say. The scriptures are so vast. We have so much knowledge that is fundamental to our practice of devotional service. And these things can, must be understood in relationship to hearing from the authorities. So therefore, one of the most important activities in devotional service is to regularly hear the philosophy from the, from the devotees of the Lord who are speaking the philosophy, especially the spiritual master, and understand the different principles like that. In Amnaya, there are nine, I'm sorry, ten main subjects. And these subjects must be heard from, from uh, the, the spiritual master. I'll read those nine, um, ten principles. The Supreme Lord Sri Hari is the only worshipable object. Brahman realization simply detaches you from or gives you the understanding of the that the material energy is simply miserable and therefore i try to merge into the brahman effulgence or i try to merge into the uh, body of the lord or paramatma uh, paramatma deals with uh, vishnu vishnu is the pr principal manifestation of krishna in the heart and he directs so paramatma realization simply remember realizes that the Lord is in the heart of all living entities. This is also done simply by the process of worshiping the Lord through the process of yoga, like that. Now, only through bhakti can you understand these principles. And bhakti covers 
these 10 principles? What are the inconceivable potencies of the Lord? The Lord is full of all spiritual rasas. The living entities, us, who are we? What is our relationship with Krishna? Why are we in this material world? We are, and there's two kinds of, of, uh, of jivas. There's the jivas who never come to the material world. They're called nitya siddhas. They remained in the spiritual world with Krishna. They never fall down. They continually serve the Lord in the spiritual world. They never touch this material energy. Sometimes these nitya siddhas come on behalf of the Lord to take up the work of the Lord by preaching pure devotional service on behalf of the Lord. We have many examples of that. Srila Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati was sent directly by the Lord to do the work of bringing Krishna consciousness in, into this world. Srila Prabhupada has also reflected in his own life that he actually was asked by the Lord to actually do this work. There's an interesting little statement. I'll just sidetrack for a minute just to give you a little indication of the power of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, we will never really understand who Prabhupada is because he is actually a Nitya Siddha who's come to do this work. Prabhupada was talking, and this was narrated by a devotee who was there in while he was massaging Srila Prabhupada. It wasn't Shruti Kirti, it was another devotee. And Prabhupada started to talk about himself. Prabhupada said, I was with Krishna in the spiritual world. And Krishna said, you go to the material world and you speak about my glories, about the process of pure devotional service. Prabhupada and his spiritual body in the spiritual world responded, go to the material world? It's a horrible place, horrible place. Krishna said, oh no, you go, you write some books and I'll protect you. So Prabhupada said, I came because Krishna wanted me to come. So yeah, we have a little understanding of the insight of this Acharya who spread Krishna consciousness around the world in such a long time. He's actually a Nitya Siddha who came and apparently was acting like one of us in terms of you know the activities we perform in the early part of his life but actually he was empowered to do this work another subject in this uh, uh, sambanda abhideya prayojana is the, lo the living entities are searching for happiness this is our nature everyone wants happiness but everyone looks for happiness according to what is their understanding of where is happiness and what is happiness. So most living entities in the material energy are looking for happiness through the mind, the senses, and the intelligence applied to activities in this world. And therefore this is called, this is called Maya, or what appears to give happiness but only gives a little relief from a little suffering and then causes more suffering based on the same activity. So real happiness, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, is not found in this place. It's found only in the spiritual world because the living entities are spiritual entities. We have a material body. We are not this material body. We live in the material body. The material body is temporary. It's been given to the living entities in order to somehow or other correct themselves for being in the wrong place and going back to the spiritual world by finding happiness in relationship to Krishna through the process of devotional service. So devotional service is susutam kartam avyayam. We'll speak about those activities that give happiness and devotional service. That'll be part of this talk a little bit later on. Okay, so not, this is our nature. Everyone is looking for happiness. Another principle that is important to understand in this thing, developing confidence, is 
that we are part and parcel of Krishna. We are a little like a little fire particle in relationship to the blazing fire. We have the same qualities of Krishna, but we are in smaller quantities. When we are connected to Krishna, we uh, we blaze nicely. Our living, our existence is nice. When we go out, we tend to extinguish our spiritual existence and we be covered covered by another energy so we everything not only us but everything in relationship to krishna is simultaneously one and different for instance uh, krishna's energies are one with krishna the example is that the sun and the sunshine are both coming from the same place the sun shine is the energy of the sun, but the energy of the sun is not the sun, but it is the sun. When we when we get covered or connected to the sunshine, we say, "Well, I'm I'm getting sun," but actually, you're not getting the sun. You're getting the energy of the sun, which is called sunlight. So there is there is when you say it's the same, you're right. When you say it's different, you're right. Both are right, but still simultaneously one and different. So that's true about anything. All of Krishna and Krishna and all his energies are all one and different. So that's the basic principle of execution of devotional service. That we are different than Krishna. We can't be Krishna. We can't be one with Krishna. We can try to be one with Krishna, but oneness is not simply having the same qualities of Krishna. That's a part of it. The real oneness is to have the same, same desire as Krishna. What is the same desire? Krishna wants to come to, for us to come back to him in loving devotional service. We want to come back to him in loving devotional service. That is the real oneness. So that is the oneness that we connect with Krishna. But we and Krishna are different. There are so many classes of spirituality, spiritualists who make a distinction between the living, who make no distinction between the living entity and God. And therefore they, they say that the living entity is just, it's also God, but God who's covered over by the material energy and when Material energy is relieved through the process of austerities and penances and various types of uh, yoga. Then one actually attains their God nature. No, when we execute bhakti, we attain our God-like nature, but we never become God. Uh, the living entity can never become God. Nityo nityanam chaitanas chaitananam eko bahunam viradati kaman that one is maintaining so many. This is an important principle because you'll find anytime you're in association with any spiritualist, practically every spiritual group all around the world has this idea that either we are God or we are meant to enjoy God, either one. We worship God for enjoyment or we worship God in order to become God. Only when you come to pure bhakti can you find the actual understanding of our relationship with God and the, and the activities that bring about that understanding, which is devotional service. Material energy is the energy of God. It's eternally separate from God and it's a transformation of the energy of God. That is another principle. Krishna is all pervading. That's another principle. He is everywhere. At the same time, he is localized in the spiritual world. But at the same time, although he is in the spiritual world in his transcendental form as Krishna in Vrindavan, or uh, Krishna in the Vaikuntha realms, both are manifestations of the Supreme Personality of God and in the spiritual world, Still, he is everywhere in the material energy, even in his personal form, that can only be understood through self-realization. In other words, Krishna is everywhere. He's right with you in his personal form, but only when we have full love for Krishna, only when we reach prema to the higher stages, can we actually see Krishna everywhere in his personal form throughout the existence. 
what is that seeing? We see the material energy, but we see Krishna in his personal form in within the material energy simultaneously. Uh, another principle of uh, nishchaya or confidence is to know the principles of Raghavu Bhakti. The Bhakti is this, this divided into what we say two categories of itself. One is uh, Vaiti Bhakti, following rules and regulations, and gradually coming to the stage of developing attraction for Krishna. And then Raghunuga Bhakti is spontaneous devotional service. Both are within the category of Sadhana Bhakti. That's not even Bhava Bhakti. Bhava Bhakti is a higher state of Bhakti. Raghunuga Bhakti leads to Bhava Bhakti, but Raghunuga Bhakti is spontaneous attraction for Krishna. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, I've come to teach Raghunuga Bhakti. Well, we have to come to that stage of developing that spontaneous love for Krishna. It's not hard to develop love for Krishna. The process is so simple. And even all these rules and regulations we hear simply support our loving understanding, our loving relationship with Krishna when we, when we understand what are these principles. But the main principle, and that was expounded so nicely yesterday by, uh, by Bhutta Bhavana, is to serve Krishna with a desire to please Krishna. Now, knowing what pleases Krishna means to contact his pure devotee, spiritual master. The spiritual master says, this is what pleased Krishna. You carry it out and you carry it out. And then was mentioned yesterday, what is that mood? The mood is, please, my dear Lord, please accept this as an offering to you. Whatever I do, whether what I'm eating, whether I'm taking care of material activities to maintain my body or my uh, relatives or whatever am I am doing in life, it, it's for you. <laughs> and then the, everything we do actually becomes bhakti. Sometimes it's called gona bhakti. Gona means those things that are bhakti, but they are parallel to the direct bhakti. In other words, the activities we perform in this world in order to live. But a devotee knows that everything I do in this world ultimately is supportive of my relationship with Krishna and pure love. So love is awakened through knowledge and through activities and devotional service. What is that knowledge? When we hear about the glories of the Lord, when we hear about his pastimes, when we chant his holy names, when we associate with his devotees who are also hearing and chanting his glories, these awaken our attraction for Krishna. It's not that we have to force ourselves to love Krishna. Sometimes devotees think, well, well, Krishna is so far away. How can I actually, you know, develop any love for him? I don't even, you know, all I know is what I hear. But if you continue to hear about his pastimes and qualities, especially in Vrindavan, which is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message to all of us, is to focus on Vrindavan Krishna as our goal of our Istadev. Our Istadev is Krishna in Vrindavan. And gradually, um, that natural love, which is already there, you don't have to bring it in from the outside, will automatically start to awaken. And then there's symptoms of that awakening. One becomes somewhat, somewhat unhappy when one is not serving Krishna. One becomes uh, enthusiastic to hear more about Krishna. One becomes enthusiastic to serve Krishna. These are some of the symptoms that develop. And the last two, last one is one has to ultimately come to the stage of prayojana. So this is the 10. Prayojana means to love Krishna. I was just listening to Srila Prabhupada speaking. One interesting lecture was in April 8th, 1973, Srimad Bhagavatam class in New York. Prabhupada's talking about love. The whole, the whole class is love. He's talking about what is the nature of love, how love works, how we love in this world, how we can actually 
the same principles that make up the our, our relationship with loving people in this world is foundational to the same to our relationship with Krishna in the spiritual world. He says, as long as we, we understand what love is in the general sense, we apply the same principles to Krishna, and that love will, will actually starts to awaken. And one of the principles Prabhupada says that when you're not with your lover, you're always thinking of your lover. So this is one of the symptoms of love, that when I'm feeling separation, therefore my separation takes the form of thinking about that, that lover and wanting to be in that in the association of the beloved. And Krishna is all lovable. <laughs> Uh, he's all lovable, and we'll, we hear the more we hear about that, we, the more we can understand that. So, okay, so this is a little bit about confidence. Confidence sometimes nischaya is also translated as um, what we say determination. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are some of the things. Then, so this verse here sums up this whole section, and it's spoken by Lord Chaitanya. Please hear about the eternal form of Lord Krishna. He is the absolute truth, devoid of duality, present in Vrindavan as the son of Maharaj, the original supreme personality of Godhead Krishna. His name is Govinda. He's full of all opulence. His eternal abode is known as Goloka Vrindavan. There are three kinds of spiritual processes for understanding the absolute truth, speculative knowledge, Brahman realization, mystic yoga, Paramatma realization, bhakti yoga, Bhagavan realization. According to these three processes, the absolute truth is manifested as Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. And we are interested in Bhagavan realization like that. Okay, so we'll go on to patience. Ah, yeah. Patience. Patience, Bhupa Goswami, is extremely necessary. And then Rupa Goswami explains a verse, which is the first verse in the Upadesh Amrita. A sober person who can tolerate the urge to speak, the mind's demands, the actions of anger, the urges of tongue, belly, and genitals is qualified to make disciples all over the world. Mm -hmm. So these urges uh, are constantly pushing. And so patience means to somehow or other tolerate these urges and learn how to use those urges in devotional service. So then we can... Bhakti Vinoda Kaur goes through everyone. The urge to speak. So everyone likes to talk. Sometimes we like to talk just because we like to talk. <laughs> we just talk because it's a thing to do. You know, sometimes it says when there's two people in the same room, if you're both quiet, it's like there's like this, you know, strange feeling. So somebody has to say something, you know in order to break the silence. But it says here, unnecessary talks, you know, take one f away from, you know, uh, this principle of patience because it's better to keep quiet. We spoke about that yesterday, useless talks like that. Um, uh, the urge for the mind, the urge uh, uh, for... Uh, uh, the tongue to want to taste something, to want to speak something, the urge for the belly to want to fill itself up, the urge for the genitals to want some release. So these are the different urges like that. So these vagams or pushings, one has one who can control these things can can control himself, herself, and the whole world. So that person becomes sober. So what is the what is the understanding? Everything has to be done in moderation, like that. So anger, when we feel ourselves getting angry, 
we know if he say something, he might be causing offense, and then the situation becomes all. Learn how to control. Dayate visayam pumsam sangha sajayate kama kama krodha vijayate krodha bhavati samoham samoham sriti bri brahma sriti brahmso burinasa burinasa pranashyati there's that word again pranashyati means to fall down so by contemplating the objects of the senses one develops attachment from them from attachment lust arises from lust anger from anger Delusion, when from delusion, bewilderment of memory, when memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. When intelligence is lost, one again falls into the material energy. So it starts by contemplating the objects of the senses. One should contemplate the objects of devotional activities. This is the contemplation. We switch that switch that contemplation to spiritual topics, spiritual activities like that. Nothing is artificial. Whatever we do can also be done in the spiritual way, whatever we do in the material way also. So uh, if we feel lusty, then we can serve Krishna and, mm, by working hard for Krishna. If we feel angry, we can direct that against those who blaspheme the devotees. Greed, we should be greedy for hearing the glories of the Lord. Illusion. Well, I'm feeling, you know, illusion. Uh, uh, illusion. Why? Because I'm without Krishna. Therefore, let me think of Krishna. Illusion's gone. Uh, pride. Well, I'm proud that I, I, I received the mercy of the Lord. I'm proud that I got a chance to engage in devotional service. I'm proud of the mercy I've been given. I'm not. It's not that me is deserving of all this, but somehow I have got it. Therefore, I am. My pride is in Krishna. My pride is in the spiritual master, like that. Of course, envy cannot be dovetailed in devotional service. Prabhupada said that has to be given up, <laughs> like that. So uh, yeah, one has to, even though one is not feeling what we say. Well, uh, the uh, happiness in devotional service, still one should uh, remain fixed in devotional service. Um, in other words, one has to control these different pushings like that. <clears throat> uh, we shouldn't ch chase after the, the, the objects of the senses, whatever comes by way of Krishna's arrangements in the form of uh, what they say, one should be satisfied by whatever foodstuffs come by whatever, whatever by natural arrangements, or whatever wealth comes by natural arrangements. That's also important. Mm -hmm. So that's important. <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, a little bit about patience. Patience means to tolerate these urges of Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Mohan, Matsarya, uh, uh, like that. Okay, now we'll speak about Tat Tat Karma Pavartanam, the various activities that are favorable for devotional service. Now, there's a beautiful verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, spoken by Krishna himself, he's speaking to Uddhava. And he tells Uddhava, what is devotional service? <clears throat> and this is Krishna's words. It's uh, from Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, chapter 19, verses 20 through 24. He says, firm faith in the... Na in, in narrations of my pastimes, firm faith in blissful narrations of past, constant chanting of my glories, unswavering attachment to ceremony worship of me, praising me through beautiful hymns, great respect for my devotional service, offering obeisances with the entire body, performing first class worship of my devotees, Conscious of me in all living entities, offering ordinary bodily activities in my devotional service, <coughs> excuse me, 
excuse me, offering words to describe my qualities, offering to mine to me, offering your mind to me, rejection of material desires, giving up wealth for my devotional service, renouncing material sense gratification and material happiness and performing all desirable activities such as charity, sacrifice, chanting vows and austerities with the purpose of achieving me. These constitute actual religious principles by which the host human beings who have actually surrendered themselves to me automatically develop love for me. What other purpose or goal could remain for my devotee? So what Krishna did is that Rupa Goswami has taken these, this verse, or these series of verses by Krishna, and he's expanded into the 40, I'm sorry, the 64 activities of devotional service, which are mentioned in the 10th chapter of Nectar of Devotion those things that we should do and those things that we should avoid. They're mentioned, starts off with Adal Gurastam, accepting a spiritual master, accepting his shelter, getting initiation, inquiring from him, uh, and then, of course, engaging in various activities under the guidance of... So these 15 statements or activities that Krishna explains Please take some time. It's again, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, verse, uh, chapter 19, verses 20 through 24. And then Rupa Goswami divides these, this thing into 64 activities. And he mentions five forms of potent devotional service. This is very important. There are five types of devotional service that are the most powerful forms of devotional service. And then he mentions them. What are they? Chanting the holy names of the Lord, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Regularly hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, or reading Bhagavatam, hearing and reading Bhagavatam. Worshipping the Lord in his form as Archivigraha, the deity associating with and serving devotees and living in a holy place. Living in a holy place, sometimes mentioned Vrindavan or Mathura, or living in a temple like that. Or if those of you who live at home, make your temple, make your home a temple by installing a form of the Lord there and beginning regular worship uh, like that. These substantiate or actually manifest in the form of the activities of pure devotional service. Holy places, devotees, Srimad Bhagavatam, like that. Hmm. Okay, and of course, um, and then he also mentions things that are very powerful to worship in relationship to that, and that is Tulsi Devi. Um, Bhakti Vinod Thakur makes this a very important part of uh, Tat Tat Karma Pravartanam, that one should regularly uh, worship Tulsi Devi by offering water, circumambulating her, chanting her glories, chanting her pranam mantras like that. This is called Tadiya. Tadiya means things in relationship to the absolute truth, which is for, which is the essence of that. So this is a little bit about Tat Tat Karma Pravartanam. Um, this, this section is quite lengthy. I'm just giving you a little bit of the essence. Uh, Srila Rupa Goswami takes each of the 64 items and explains each one in detail. I won't go into that because it's quite lengthy. I'll leave it up to you. Take some time. It's mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion, those 64 items like that. And you can get a little bit of an understanding of uh, these 64 items and how they're practiced by reading commentaries on Nectar of Devotion by the Acharyas. We have those also available. You just have to. One devotee in our movement. Uh, Sannyasi Dhanadar Swami wrote a thing called 
Bhakti Waves. Bhakti Waves is a book on the uh, on the uh, tire nectar devotion. It was extremely extremely well done. It breaks down the whole Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and so we can easily understand some of the more hard, difficult things and how to practice Krishna consciousness. The next one is Sangha Tiaga, renouncing unfavorable associations. There's two kinds of unfavorable associations. One is called the non-devotees and the other one is called opposite sex. <clears throat> Uh, so one should be very much careful not to associate with the non-devotees. What does that mean? I'm going to read you something that actually explains what association is. Um, let's see. Sometimes devotees get mm, mixed up about, well, what does it mean to, to associate with the non-devotees and what does it mean to avoid that association? This is if, okay. I just uh, give you. Well, one must accept proximity within both good and bad people as they pass through life. This equally applies to householders and renunciates. Proximity must be there. Nevertheless, one should not engage in bad association. Giving in charity, in other words, we go to the fourth verse now of Nectar of Instructions. What are the six loving exchanges between devotees? If one performs these six loving exchanges with the non-devotees, that is accepting materialistic association or wrong association. We can still do these six things with non-devotees, but there has to be one element that is not allowed in that association that we apply with devotees, and I'll, it'll be explained here. Giving in charity, accepting charity, revealing one's mind, hearing one's mind, accepting food and giving food, if done with love, these are called sangha or association. Giving some foodstuffs to a hungry person and accepting some charity from a pious man is done out of duty, not out of love. Even if they are materialists, this type of engagement is not a considered association. But if they are pure devotees, then such activities are performed out of love, or devotees. When acts are performed out of love, that is association. Therefore, in giving charity to pure Vaishnavas and accepting items of wealth from them, becomes satsanga, desirable association. Giving charity to a materialist or accepting charity from one, if done out of love, becomes asatsanga, wrong association. When a materialist approaches you, whatever is required to be done should be done out of duty only, only out of duty. One should not speak confidentially with a materialist Generally, there is some love involved in confidential speaking. Therefore, it is association. While meeting a materialistic friend, one should speak only what is extremely necessary. At that time, it is better not to exhibit it heartfelt love. But if that friend is a proper Vaishnava, then one should accept his association by speaking to him with love. This type of behavior with relatives and friends creates no hostility. There is no association in ordinary talk. One should behave with ordinary people as one externally behaves with a stranger while buying something in the market. The same dealings with a pure devotee of the Lord should be done out of love. If one is obliged to feed hungry people, needy people and teachers, he should do it as a host dutifully cares for his guest. There should be no need to exhibit love. Care for them, but not out of love. One should feed pure Vaishnavas with love, and when required, accept the remnants given by them with love. 
if one can behave in this way while giving in charity, accepting in charity, speaking confidentially, hearing confidentially, feeding and accepting food from one's wife, children, servants, maidservants, strangers, whoever else one meets, then there is no unholy association, only good association. There is no hope in achieving devotion to serve to Krishna unless one gives up unholy association in this way. And then it goes on to explain uh, how uh, one should, you know, live their life according to householders and according to renunciates like that. Okay. So that's the, th the thing. And there's another thing. One has to give up prejudices also, and one has to give up what we say, um, what is the other thing? Prejudice and attachments. Prejudice means certain uh, ways that we think about things in the material world. And if we carry these, what we say, these, these tendencies that are due to our association from our past, these things also can, what we say, break down our Krishna consciousness. Attachments to prejudice is destroyed by by following the ten offenses to the holy name, like that, and chanting the holy names of the Lord. If we can maintain attachments to prejudices, that means that our you know the way we deal with the the material world based on our material, then. Uh, we can't be able to chat properly. Attachments for assets, in other words, whatever we have, our, our uh, property that we own, any, any material things we own, should be used in the service of the Lord. We take whatever we need to live happily like that, um, and then we can give up that attachment. Nothing is ever given up in devotional service. Everything is still there. The only thing is the consciousness by which we perf we perform it. That's the difference between material consciousness and Krishna consciousness, is doing things in a mood of detachment and in a mood of service to Krishna. Material things are done in this mood of detachment. Uh, activities and devotional service are done to please Krishna. And then, of course, you know, Study this verse, Nectar of Instructions, verse number four. Srila Prabhupada makes this point very, very strongly. He says, we have established this entire Krishna Consciousness Society with all its temples simply to facilitate these six loving exchanges between devotees. You know, uh, to speak confidentially, to hear confidentially, to give gifts, to receive gifts, to offer transcendental foodstuffs, to receive foodstuffs. There's a, there's a whole science on how to do that in a spiritual way, and that's explained in this very lengthy purport by Srila Prabhupada in the Nectar of Instructions. Like that. And the last one is Sadhu Vritti, following in the footsteps of the previous Acharyas. Hmm. Uh, Bhakti Vinota Kaur spends about 25 pages describing this one. What are the duties of the renunciates in relationship to following the process of devotional service? And what are the duties of the grihastas? Some of these things are the same and some of them are different like that. In order to, pr to understand this Sadhu Vritti carefully, there is one verse that's mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Maybe Radha Bhakti, you can post this verse. It's not one verse, it's five verses. It's Canto 7, verse 11, chapter 11, verses 8 through 12. These are the general propensities of the human beings in the mode of goodness. So in order to practice following in the footsteps of the previous Acharyas, one has to raise themselves gradually from the lower modes to the mode of goodness. One has to perform all activities in the mode of goodness. And this ver these series of verses describe what are these activities that also complement the mode of goodness. And uh, this verse is actually the foundation 
for Varnashram Dharma. Now, Srila Prabhupada wanted devotees to follow their Varna, what it means, their natural propensities, but engage it in devotional service. In other words, it's called Daivi Varnashram. That means whatever material propensities you have, take them and use them in devotional service. In other words, those things that are that are of the mode of goodness like that. So here, I'll read these 30 things. It may take a little bit of time, but I'll try to go through them so you get a little idea. Speaking the truth without distortion or deviation. These are all qualities of the mode of goodness. Feeling sympathy for everyone else's suffering. Right now we're in that situation where see so many people are suffering. It's not that we say, oh, well, that's their karma. That's what they get. Devotees don't think like that. They think, well, if I can help them get free from the suffering, then by giving them Krishna consciousness or giving them some relief, then I perform some service. Uh, observing fast at least twice a month, that's on the codice. In other words, observing codice. Cleanliness, bathing regularly at least thrice a day. It says thrice, I'm sorry, twice, twice. Morning and evening. And remembering to chant the holy names of God. Tolerance, being unagitated by seasonal changes or inconvenient circumstances. Welcome to COVID. This is, a, we have to be <laughs> unagitated by this situation. In other words, Krishna has arranged this somehow or other for purification of the world and people are getting purified and devotees are getting opportunities to go deeper into Krishna consciousness. Our lifestyle has been thrown into a different, you know, what we say, cycle. We're learning how to live in a different way for a little while uh, just to experience and then we learn how to tolerate. We have to tolerate some inconveniences like that. Distinguishing between good and bad, not allowing the mind to act whimsically, now allowing the senses to act without control, uh, nonviolence, not subjecting any, any living entity, even an ant, to any of the miseries of the material world, uh, brahmacharya, remaining, in other words, uh, continence or abstaining from misuse, uh, of one's own uh, bodily energies, not indulging sex with women other than one's own wife, and not having sex with one's own wife when sex is forbidden, like during the menstruation period, giving in charity at least 50% of one's income, reading transcendental literature, Bhagavad Gita, and so on, freedom from mental duplicity, being satisfied, with that which is available without sincere endeavor. This is a very important. Uh, devotees get an anxiety. I don't have this. Or I need this. I don't want this. Whatever comes by Krishna's arrangement, learn how to be satisfied and learn how to, to use it in Krishna's service. Rendering service to saintly persons who make no distinction between one living entity and another. Uh, not taking part in so-called philanthropical activities, distinguishing between unnecessary activities, being grave and silent, that means not speaking nonsense, searching into the self, what is the difference between the body and the soul, equal distribution of food and drink, accepting all living entities as being related intimately with the Lord, as well as hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, uh, service, serving, worshiping, offering obeisances, accepting service, considering oneself. These are the nine processes of, devo of devotional service, uh, like that. Uh, accepting service, considering Krishna as a friend, surrendering everything. According to the differentiations of these 30 ca characteristics, the four Varnas, Brahman, Kshatri, Vaishnava, and Susra, and the four ashrams are born. So these are the basic principles of the human beings. <laughs> so these, this verse is very, very, these verses are very, very important. 
Uh, we have one of our senior um, sannyasis, uh, Shiva Ram Maharaj. He's doing a whole delineation of this verse um, and uh, making this the foundation for establishing Daivi Van Ashram in, in our society. Without developing these qualities, which are all in the mode of goodness, we cannot practice Krishna consciousness steadily. And that's the point. We get deviated if we're not in the mode of goodness. And these are the qualities that are the foundation to the mode of goodness. So, okay, so look up that verse. So uh, there's much more on Sadhu Vritti, but we'll stop here because we need to have some time for a little discussion like that. And there are verses for householders. There's verses for uh, uh, for renunciates. Um, Bhakti Vinod Thakur uses the word occupation for activities. Occupation has two activities to it, or two means. What is my propensity? That means what is my nature and what is my lifestyle? Is my lifestyle and my propensity lined up in, in devotional service? And if it's not, this is something that we should work on. Okay. So I kind of raced through that because it really requires, you know, at least three classes just on this, on what we just did now. But I hope I was able to uh, give you a little understanding of some of the things that are favorable for devotional service. Um, we need to know that, and we also need to know very carefully what to avoid. As we mentioned earlier, that verse, Ayabila Sita Sunya Jnana Kamananavritam, Anukalena Krishna Silanam Bhakti Uttama contains these 12 items, what is favorable and what is unfavorable. When you go deeper into that verse and start understanding the meanings of each and every word in that verse. So Rupa Goswami has expanded on that verse, which is the Paribhasa Sutra, the foundation, in describing what are the six things we should avoid and the six things we should accept like that. Okay, so we'll stop here and uh, be happy to try to answer some questions from the devotees. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much. I loved your point about the success in devotion service takes practice. I think you've given us all hope and solace by saying that. Thank you. So just to let you know, we have Vishaka Mataji online, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu, Sudananda Prabhu online. So just to let you know. Okay. If any of those devotees would like to make a comment or would like to say anything, I'm happy, we're happily ready to hear. <laughs> Do it online, I'm not sure, but I don't think so. And she was right. we, we can take the next question otherwise, Maraj. Okay. Okay, so the next question is a simple question, but a very powerful question. And it's from Sunny Prabhu. And he is asking, how can I start practicing bhakti yoga as a beginner? Well, we say the whole process begins by hearing. So hear as much as possible through reading and through associating with devotees who are speaking on Krishna consciousness. Go to lectures, uh, go to the temple for classes, seminars, hear, hear as much as possible. The process of hearing works to awaken one's uh, desire to serve the Lord, and it also brings about the knowledge of transcendence. So read, 
and here. I think many of us who came to Krishna consciousness got a book. And we start reading that book and we got some more books and then we read some more books. And after reading a few books, we decided to meet these people who actually put out the books. And that brought us into association with devotees. And then we start tending to prana, the temples and getting association. And gradually, we started to understand what is devotional service and became, what we say, active in that way. So it all starts with, uh, you know, hearing. Thank you, Maharaj. We can go on to the next question, unless um, any senior devotees would like to make a comment. Okay, so the next question is from Veena Mataji. She's asking, Hare Krishna Maharaj, as Krishna is on a spiritual plane, and if we are not that elevated, do we have to approach him through Radharani or Lord Shiva? Who are more his top topmost devotees to establish a connection with the Supreme Lord? Take him, you can approach him through Radharani's representative, which is the spiritual master. <laughs> Radharani is, she's Prem Guru. Uh, Lityananda is the original Guru. So Prem Guru and original Guru manifest themselves in the form of the spiritual master. So uh, uh, we approach through Nityananda's representative. And so the spiritual master is the bona fide representative of Nityananda because Nityananda is Guru Tattva. Balaram, Nityananda is the same, are Guru Tattva. So one has to approach Krishna on the spiritual platform through, through the proper channels, which is his representatives in this world, like that. We can pray. If you pray to Radharani, what she'll do is she'll direct you to the spiritual master. If you pray to Lord Shiva, he'll do the same. If you pray to these personalities, they'll simply hear your prayers and show you where to go, which means to his representative who are present on this earth, who are there simply to give Krishna's Krishna to others. Many people have worshipped Shiva before they came to Bhakti. And what did Shiva do? He sent them to the representative, to Krishna's representative. I hope that answers your question, Bina Mataji. If not, please let us know via the chat. Um, can I ask you the next question, Maharaj? Of course. Mm -hmm. okay. Next question is from Govinda Das. He's asking, on the subject of endeavoring with intelligence, what is recommended to sharpen our intelligence so that we may serve and grow in our spiritual practice? Guru Saru Sastra. Um, the words of the spiritual master, the words of Krishna through the scriptures, the lives and the teachings of the acharyas have, have gone before us. All these things are available. We have to hear from them. We have to uh, ask questions when it's, when it's, and then everything becomes clear. As it explains that uh, those who are inquisitive, you know, they can open up the door to bhakti. There's that verse in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, second chapter like that. If you have doubts, doubts are destroyed by transcendental knowledge, but doubts lead to apathy and inertia or uh, wrong activities. So one has to destroy doubts, get a clear understanding of both the knowledge and the practice from Guru, Shadow, and Sastra. We call this the, tr three, the triangle of truth. All knowledge comes from three, these three sources. The basis is scripture, and guru and sadhu work on the basis of scripture. Sadhus live their life on the, based on scripture. The guru speaks on the basis of scripture. 
but they speak in such a way as to make the knowledge relevant for time, place, and circumstance. So if you just read scripture and you don't hear from the, the living scripture, just like it says, the, the spiritual master is the transparent via media to Krishna. He is also what is called antaryami. Antaryami means the external manifestation of a super soul. So God in the heart manifests himself in the form of the spiritual master who teaches what the Lord is saying directly. So yeah, through these three channels, but mostly through Guru, we learn everything like that. And we also read Shastra. If Shastra is clear, then that's fine. But if, it, if it's not clear, then we have to get a clarification by asking Guru. Thank you. Please accept my beloved senses all by Shri Prabhupada Maharaj. Jai Sundar Nanda Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, wonderful class. And uh, it was, uh, it's been a wonderful day. It's been non-stop hearing since morning. We had uh, Govind Prabhu and then we had Sachinan Maharaj. And then as soon as he finished his class, your class started. So it's been a wonderful day. I just wanted to share um, a point about uh, Dharyat Maharaj, the patience. And um, when I was thinking of patience, I was thinking of uh, um, Hanuman. And Hanuman had gone to uh, Lanka to find and give the message of his Lord Ram to Sita. So after many obstacles, he gets to Lanka and then he has self-doubt when he goes to all the palaces and sees these women and everything else. And he says, he thinks that he may never find Sita. So when he gets to Ashok Vatika and he sees Sita, he recognizes her straight away and he wants to straight away jump in front of her and wants to tell her that he's there. But then he suddenly realizes that I have to act patiently here. Impatience is not the virtue. So after many obstacles, he gets to Lanka and then he has Ashok Vatika and he sees Sita. He recognizes her straight away and he wants to straight away jump in front of her and wants to tell her that he's there. But then he suddenly realizes that I have to act patiently here. Impatience is not the virtue. He was talking to her and you know, giving all sorts of uh, threats and everything else and Rakshasis were there. But he thought if I jump straight away, she would think that I'm one of them. I'm either Ravan in disguise or I'm one of the monkeys that have been sent by Ravan. So he took his time, meditated on Lord Ram and then started singing beautiful bhajans of Ram and started singing the pastimes of the Lord. And that uh, was an eye opener for me because as a surgeon, I'm very impatient. I have, I, I won't have to fix everything straight away, uh, even if it comes to Krishna consciousness. And that's the only thing what you're out of the six you've mentioned doesn't resonate with me is patience because I want to be doing it straight away. But Maharaj, you rightly said that we have to be patient and uh, sometimes impatience or, or, or being too enthusiastic also can be, uh, can, can lead to a negative effect. So just wanted to share that with you, Maharaj. Thank you. Patience is precluded or pre prefaced by, by thought, thinking about the situation, then acting. If you're enthusiastic to act and you're eager to go ahead, it should be guided by proper intelligence, which means to reflect on the, on the present situation, gather as much knowledge from experience and based on the situation at hand, and then go ahead. If, without making these preliminary, uh, what we say, uh, evaluations, then there's a chance to, uh, you know, make a mistake or somehow or other cause another problem. So, yeah. Sure. So thoughtfulness is also a principle of uh, activity and not just performing the activity. We have to, you know, preface that by thinking about how to do it. Okay, something else? Okay, thank you, Zunanda Prabhu. The next question is anonymous. How can we remain enthusiastic when it feels like our devotional service is not yielding any results? For example, when we organize preaching programs and no one comes. 
Hmm. Well, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati dealt with that directly. He said, if you're preaching and no one comes and preach to the four walls, because our business is to preach. So even if, if you're preaching to the four walls, there will be benefit. Uh, give you an, I give you another practical example. When Prabhupada was in, in, uh, in uh, <clears throat> what was it? New York City in the early days, the devotees wanted to hold a public program. And so they hired this big hall. And, uh, and so when they put posters all over the town and they advertised it in different venues. And so when it was time for the, the lecture, you know, the, the thing could hold a couple hundred seats. There was seven people who came. <laughs> so, and Prabhupada preached to those seven people like there was 700 people there. At the end, um, when devotees came up and said, oh, Prabhupada, we're sorry, hardly anybody came. Prabhupada said, didn't you see Narada Muni was here? <laughs> so Prabhupada was saying, so if you're preaching, you know, that in itself is success. And if somebody comes, that's good. If so, nobody comes, preach anyway. <laughs> Because just by preaching, you're going to please the demigods, you're going to please the great saints, you're going to please the Lord. It doesn't really matter. You made an effort to preach, just preach. Of course, we want results, we want people to come, and we feel inspired by that. But one should not become what we say, you know, what we say, apathetic or feel like all oh, was unsuccessful. We have another example with one great devotee in our movement. He was asked to give a class by one teacher. So the teacher invited him to come into his class. Um, and so when he came into the class, the thing is, it was a special class arranged just for him. It wasn't a regular class. The teacher had inspired all his students. Say, one person came, just one person. And so they took that one person, brought him into the teacher's room, and the devotee and the teacher and that one person spoke for, about the Krishna consciousness. That devotee wound up becoming a great devotee and became a leader in our society. <laughs> so, you know, you can't really judge results by who comes or who doesn't come. Thank you, Maharaj. I hope that answered your question, Anonymous. The next question is pertinent to quite a few of us, Maharaj, and it's it's hard to understand why we... Uh, you broke up there. Sorry, Maharaj. I'll start here. <laughs> it's hard to understand why we shouldn't be loving towards non-devotees? Shouldn't we be loving to all as a good impression for Vaishnavas? We can serve others, but as soon as the loving mood starts coming in, then you're gonna you're gaining that association. And then, of course, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, and with Rupa Goswami's verses, he says, then that is association, that is Atsat Sangha association. That can lead to fall down. It will. Out of all the principles that how, how one can fall down the fastest, there's two things that really make fall down fast. One is speaking nonsense, and even more dangerous than that is association with non-devotees. So we, we made the distinction between what is association and what is not association. So you can serve others who are non-devotees by giving them something or you know, giving them some prasadam, telling them about Krishna consciousness like that. Loving means affection for, then if you start showing affection for, then you open up the door to association in a, in a, in a different level, in a different way. So uh, then that becomes asat sung, and it leads to fall down. 
So yeah, I think I read I read that particular part that Bhakti Vinod Thakur makes the point: do it out of duty <laughs> and not out of love. Duty is duty is also nice. For devotees, everything should be done in a loving way. Yeah. Devotees should develop affection for each other and serve each other in that mood and associate in that mood either also. Of course, with the opposite sex, we also be careful in that. But still, the proper, that is the proper mood in, uh, in relationships in Vaishnava circles sometimes we're very we're very dutiful to the devotees and very loving to the non-devotees <laughs> so that, that seems to be contrary to our spiritual uh, growth all right Krishna, can i add something to that orange yes please thank you Krishna. So I was just, um, I was recalling a point that was made by Bhakti Tirta Maharaj in the class on this point. He said that, um, he said, often we think that it be, that the non-devotees are better behaved. He said, but what we, what we sometimes fail to understand is that they'll have many outlets for their passions. So some people will be, it will be through drink, others will be through like extramarital affairs or whatever it is. So those, those additional outlets. And he was making the point that the devotees, They've given up so many of these other things. So when you see them, you're kind of you're seeing more the the raw character, which is obviously in that process of refinement. So therefore, we should kind of give them that additional credit because it's not the same as someone who's just engaging lots of material activities to kind of mask or have escapist roots for their for their energies. And then there was one other thing that um, that came up a few, I think it was a year or so ago, and that was that we often compare people unfair unfairly. So when we, so sometimes it is said that the non-devotees act better than the devotees, but often when we say that, we're often comparing a, a non-devotee in the mode of goodness to a devotee in the mode of passion or ignorance. But if you compare the like for like, then you'll generally see that if you're comparing like for like, then the devotees would actually have, then they'll be, they'll be outstanding. Mm -hmm. There is that verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. What is that verse? Uh, five, eighteen. 12, yeah, this is the first line of that verse. Um, oh, I can't remember it. But 518.12, Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, anybody got the Bhagavatam ready? We can go on to the next question while we're waiting, Maharaj, or shall yeah. we? Yes, Maharaj, I have it. Oh, we can. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Esya Bhaktir, Bhagavati Akinchana. Yeah, go ahead. Sarvaisana. 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 Samasate Suraha. Harava Bhaktasya Kuto Mahadguna. Manurade Nasati. Davato Bahihi. You want me to read translation, Maharaj? Yeah. Uh, translation all the demigods and their exalted qualities such as religion knowledge and renunciation become manifest in the body of one who has developed unalloyed devotion for the supreme personality of godhead vasudeva on the other hand a person devoid of devotion service and engaged in material activities has no good qualities even if he is adept at the practice of mystic yoga are the honest endeavor of maintaining his family and relatives. He must be dri driven by his own mental speculations and must engage in the service of the Lord's external energy. How can there be any good qualities in such a man? Yeah, and then of course Prabhupada pur purport includes the 26 qualities of a devotee and then the explanations of what it means to associate. Yeah. So yeah, 
read that verse and you'll get a greater understanding of uh, the importance of uh, how association plays out and why devotee association is not only desirable, it's rare and it's and it's it, it fulfills all of our desires. Thank you, Prabhu, for sharing. Thank you, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Uta Bhavana, for that point. That was interesting. Um, yeah, if any, anyone else? Okay, the next comment is on the chat and is from Lalita Angi Radha Devi Dasi. And she's saying, thank you so much, Maharaj, for the soothing class that was like a cooling, cascading, clear waterfall on our consciousness. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's very poetic. Thank you. <laughs> are there pointers to understand if we are performing Yagna Mishra Bhakti? What are the points that it stands if we're, if we're performing karma mishra bhakti? Is it karma mishra bhakti? Is that what she's saying? Oh, jnana mishra bhakti. Yeah. Jnana mishra bhakti means that when we're simply trying to um, get free from material desire and material sufferings. That's all. That's bhakti that, that detaches us from all material activities and brings us to the perfection of jnana misra bhakti is, is Brahman realization. But Brahman realization, there's no love. So jnana misra bhakti, what are some of the symptoms of performing jnana misra bhakti? Accumulating of knowledge, just reading all kinds of books to be knowledgeable in various aspects of of spiritual topics like that, with a desire to uh, to uh, detach themselves from what is wrong and and practice what is beneficial, what is wrong in terms of how to avoid uh, uh, how to avoid suffering, what is right, how to avoid suffering, and what is wrong what is wrong by uh, uh, or, uh, what is oh, excuse me? I got it backwards. In other words, uh, accumulating knowledge just for the sake of knowing things and trying to somehow or other arrange your life in such a way that you could you don't suffer in the material world. That's all. And Krishna is also there, but he's there in the sense that he also is there to fulfill our desires to reach the Brahman. In other words, freedom from all material miseries. It's a stage. It's you know, Vedanti tad tad bad vidyam kyadgyanam avyam brahmeti paramatma misi bhagavan iti sabjate. Jnana yoga leads to Brahman realization, but Brahman realization is incomplete, and it's also temporary. So cultivation of knowledge, performing austerities for the sake of detaching themselves, giving in charity chanting mantras to develop higher consciousness. All these things are pra pra activities of the jnanis like that. Uh, they also talk about what is favorable for uh, jnan and what is unfavorable for jnan like that. They're, they're into various types of yoga like that. They perform uh, Astanga Yoga. Krishna talks about Astanga Yoga in the Bhagavad Gita, and then he, after he tells about oh, how it works, he says, uh, we don't need it. So there's a whole chapter on Jnana Yoga in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. I'm not sure the number of the chapter, but if you read that chapter, it just tells you, explains everything what a jnana yoga is and where what is the actual result of jnana yoga. 
Bhagavatam will, and uh, talks about bhakti yoga, karma yoga, and jnana yoga. But the conclusion is bhakti. You can read Bhagavatam, and you can also look at Bhagavatam from the from a Gali point of view, and say this is the goal of, of Bhagavatam. Also, those who know Bhagavatam well can understand that the Gyanis can read and study Bhagavatam and say this is the benefit of Bhagavatam. Karmis can perform karma yoga. They can also say because there's verses that mention each of these. But unless you read the whole thing based on the purports of the acharyas then you'll 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 you know you can get confused with what is the actual goal of Srimad bhagavatam you have to hear from the acharyas who give the actual understanding of what is bhagavatam okay would any senior devotees like to share any comment or qu on this or question? Okay, we've got time for two more questions, Marge. Shall I ask? Oh, sorry. Yeah, continue. Okay. Next question is from Roberto. Prabhu, and he's saying, for a devotee to easily advance in devotional service, he or she needs to have firm faith, determination, enthusiasm, intelligence. What other qualities should we have to develop? What other qualities besides these? Yes, firm faith, determination, enthusiasm, and intelligence. Mm. Um. Should be uh, equipoised in happiness and distress. That's a very key one. Dira, it's called equanimity. Mm -hmm. One should be simple. That's another important quality. One should be tolerant. That's a very important quality, highly important quality. One should be humble. That's a very important quality. That's foundational. When Krishna speaks the 20 items of knowledge, he says, Amanitam Anambitam. He mentions Amanitam means humility. He mentions that first. Humble humility, tolerance, uh, knowledge of the scriptures, wisdom that comes from that knowledge, that is, Gyan and Vigyan. All these things are re required. Simplicity. Following religious principles. That covers most of it. There's the 26 characteristics of the devotee that's mentioned in that verse we, we read. Read those 26 characteristics. Such Rup Maharaj has written one book. I have it here. It's actually called Vaishnav Behavior, 26 Qualities of the Devotees. And he's expanded on each one of them. And uh, that was published in 1983. I think it's, uh, it may be out of print now. But it's not hard to find in Vaishnav libraries around the world. So he mentions those 26 qualities and expands on each one of them. It's a really, really nicely presented book. Okay, so any other questions? I think when you were mentioning about the 11th canto, I think you're talking about the Uddhav Gita. And uh, I'm just going to share this. Um, anybody is interested in the reference that you were mentioning it's in the um, chapter 15 uh, chapter 14 krishna starts uh, mentioning um, introducing the um, yoga ladder or yoga uh, system to uddhava and in the 15th chapter he's talking about the mystic yoga perfections i think that's what you were mentioning yeah 
Isn't there a chapter called Jnana Yoga just by itself? Um, I don't recall. Um, there's the Sankhya Yoga, but that comes much later. But uh, Mystic Yoga, I think, covers um, that portion of Mystic Yogis leading to Jnana Yoga. Mystic Yoga leads to Paramatma realization. So, Jnana Yoga leads, leads to uh, Brahman realization. Yeah, that's the only thing I could figure out. I thought I'd just share that. But uh, yeah, but the eleventh canto is full, of it. and of course, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, it says that the the it's from chapter 13 to chapter 18 uh, has a lot to do with jnana yoga especially chapter 13 okay so we can take two more questions maraj oh, oh wait a minute yeah, oh. we got an answer. Nanda Vardhana says chapter 28 from uh, the 11th canto is Jnana Yoga. Yeah. I actually got the chapter right here. Let me see. Chapter 28. Let's see. Yeah, 28 is Jnana Yoga. That's the t title of the, the chapter. 1128 is Jnana Yoga. And chapter 29 is Bhakti Yoga. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. We can take two more questions, Maharaj. Is that okay before we close? I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> So the next question is from Milan Malenik. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Prabhu. Does Raganuga Bhakti require knowledge? Since there are examples of people who are illiterate but shed tears as they are, as, as they, I'll start again. Illiterate but shed tears as they enter the temple. Well, shedding tears is not necessarily Raganuga Bhakti. Even uh, even uh, a new a person just coming into Krishna consciousness for the first time, walking into the temple, sometimes shed tears. <laughs> That's not necessarily a symptom of Raganuga Bhakti. Um, and that tear, tears of joy, tears of you know, uh, awakening something spiritual within their own heart. Yeah. So. Um, Raganuga Bhakti is spontaneous, but to get to Raganuga Bhakti, the, pro the process, one has to follow the process as given by the Acharyas. So one has to know the process like that. So the process is to hear and chant the glories of the Lord and develop attachment for hearing and chanting the dwellings of the Lord. Swarochisa, that means uh, one who develops attachment to hear and chant, one develops a taste for hearing and chanting. When one becomes spontaneously attracted to hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, that's the beginning of uh, Raganuga Bhakti. One becomes, uh, that spontaneous uh, attraction to the activity leads to eagerness to serve Krishna in different ways. When that eagerness becomes intensified, it becomes greedy, and then when one becomes greedy uh, for uh, for devotional service. Hmm. Vishaka Mataji, would you like to share something? You are unmuted. Oh, again, I would like to thank Maharaj for the very comprehensive and sober presentation. I think it's very enlivening and appropriate for this time for all of us. Thank you so much for your time and your and your devotion and also your scholarliness. Thank you for for your scholarliness and for your inspiration in so many ways.
Thank you, Mataji. Your humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. Jai Prabhupada. Thank you very much for hosting us. Um, thank you for your association. Maharaj, it's two o'clock. I don't know whether you'd like us to. Um, we have questions. We have tons of questions which we've missed. Uh, what shall we uh, do? Uh, I'm, I'm not in a hurry to leave. I'm, I'm here. You know, this is my last class tomorrow. Uh, Bhuta Bhavan and Janaki now take over the show, and uh, you'll get to hear some really interesting, uh, uh, sweet, sweet and interesting points on Krishna consciousness. So, I'm still ready to answer some more questions if, if you have more patience to read them. We can take two more questions, Marsh, then, for today. You and decide. You, you can decide. <laughs> <laughs> Marsh, the next question is from our god brother, Nikhil. He is saying, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. I have a question regarding um, activity with the opposite sex. You've mentioned that we should avoid people of the opposite sex. How can we do this when our daily life we have to associate with the opposite sex? How should we treat the opposite sex? What, what should we do and how should our behavior be in our interactions? Well, I think that comes back to the same thing. When it's done with affection and attachment, that becomes the wrong kind of association. Uh, if one is in Grihasta life, it says that one should associate with their wife and not even associate with other women unless there is some need to carry out some uh, practical activities or some devotional activities. But that's not association. It's uh, when you enter into a, a, a relationship based on uh, opening up your, your heart and your mind to that person, and then you're moving into the area of what is called atsatsanga, wrong association. And then attachment can also develop and will develop. <laughs> so yeah, we, you, and of course, in that association, one should uh, just carry on what is necessary. And if one feels victimized when they're in that association, even if it's ordinary dealings, one should um, move away from that. means that one's not ready for that type of interaction. In other words, if your mind becomes agitated in association of the opposite sex, then, uh, or if you forget about Krishna, <laughs> then you should move away from that. It's better to keep your Krishna consciousness strong and to take a chance and allow that to uh, bring you down. But if you are carefully controlling the mind and senses and you're just keeping everything in a very business-like way, then you can carry on with the activities. But then again, one should not dally in that for too long, especially for those in the renounced order. For the renounced order, brahmacharis, sannyasis like that, no association with the opposite sex is allowed like that. Of course, we have to, we, we do that in order to carry on the, the activities of devotional service. But that's all. But then that has to be done in, in the utmost minimum amount of time. The strength that you get from being not become victimized by that association comes from chanting of the holy names of the Lord. There's where you get your strength. I hope that answered your question, Nikhil Prabhu. Let us know if you need further clarification online. Thank you. The next question is, how do we purify our intention to go from mixed devotional service to pure devotional service? Does it come naturally or do we have to practice and progress in devotional service? 
No, we should aspire after uh, pure devotional service. We hear, we should hear about the lives of the pure devotees and how they practice pure devotional service. Um, read about them from the Bhagavatam. Hear about the lives of the pure devotees. Understand the difference between uh, mixed devotion and that's explained nicely in Srimad Bhagavatam. What is real? What is pure devotion? What is mixed devotion? Learn, aspire for what you want to be like. You want to be a pure devotee? Practice pure devotional service. So learn what that is and practice it. And the inspiration comes by association with advanced devotees and hearing about the great souls who are actually on the platform of pure devotional activity. It says that uh, if you take a crystal and you place it somewhere, all the objects in range of that crystal reflect that the, it's reflected in the crystal also. So in the same way, through the association of pure devotees, you also develop pure devotional qualities. And you associate by hearing about them, by reading about them, and by direct association also. Okay. I think we're mindful of the time, Maharaj. We'll take one more question and then hear from senior devotees before we close today. So the last, last question is, dear Maharaj, Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Sri Prabhupada. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I have a question. The material world is so opposed to Krishna consciousness. Sometimes we find that even in the Krishna consciousness movement, we can create obstacles for each other. So how do we remain determined for the long haul, despite all the obstacles we have? This is from Varshana Devidasi. Whoa, <laughs> I think she knows the answer to that one, but she's asking me. <laughs> okay, how do we stop creating obstacles for each other when we're trying to get to the platform of <laughs> pure devotional service? <laughs> uh, uh, boy, I know you, should, I guess you're asking that for on behalf of someone else, so I can. I'll try to answer it. Uh, let me see. Well, I think there's one quali qualification that makes everything wonderful in association with devotees, and that is humility. When we're always humble in the association of devotees, there's never any obstacles. In fact, we become an inspiration just by our presence. Well, when, a, when a humble devotee is present, everyone benefits. When devotees are present, everyone benefits. But humility is actually such a desirable quality that it's mentioned that humility itself is actually a principle of bhakti. It stands above all the other qualities and shines on its own humility. When humility needs to be understood and what actually what is real humility. It's both a state of consciousness and an external a display of that consciousness in day to day life. So practicing humility means we become an, an asset to everyone in association with others. Would, sorry, Maharaj, carry on. Oh. I was going to just add, and whatever we do, when it's connected in a humble way, it becomes even, even it has a much more uh, benefit for 
for for oneself and for everyone no matter what you do whether it's a small service or it's giving a class or whatever it is when humility is there then everything is uh, what we say auspicious the humility is so powerful it even attracts the attention of the non devotees mm -hmm. And that's what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati told his preachers. He says, when you go to the West, you'll find there'll be many difficulties, but do one thing, practice this one verse, Trinata Fi Suniche Na Tayori Vasuhishnuna, Amani Namamana Dena. He said, if you practice humility, always you'll get the attention and the audience of everyone <laughs> thank you Maharaj uh, unless any senior devotees want to add or comment we can close on this question Thank you, Maharaj. Um, we realize we have not answered many questions, but we've got a Q&A session tomorrow. So we will take forward additional questions from today and yesterday. So is it okay, Maharaj, if we close now? I thank everyone for the opportunity to speak and, uh, and I, th I uh, pray that somehow or other there was something beneficial uh, transmitted today uh, and so uh, and I thank Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu and all the senior devotees uh, for all the support that they're giving to this this whole uh, presentation on pure devotional service all glories to Srila Prabhupada Samaveda Bhakta Vindaki Jai <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Wonderful Thank you, Maharaj. class. Maharaj. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare